Uh, this is a show about failure. You appear to have the smarts. Why aren't you not a billionaire by now? Yeah. So I can look at life that way and say, hey, am I a failure? I get on stage, Putin is sitting there on stage as well. I begin my presentation. What I did not bargain for was that this is being telecast live uh, across in Russia. And I was advised by my office that you better uh, leave the country. Let's be fair, we're seeing weddings, you know, of the size that could feed an entire state for a very long time. There is inequality. But is that a portion of capitalism that should just make us proud? Or is, that, is, is there an injustice there that needs to be remedied? You need a crisis, unfortunately, to change course. And until that happens, you keep rolling down the same path. Rishi, thank you so much for speaking with me. Um, for our audience who's not familiar, you're an extremely respected international investor. Um, you run your own fund. You're the chairperson of Rockefeller International and um, a published author many times over with an international, multiple international bestsellers. Uh, we're here because you've written a book on what went wrong with capitalism. Um, this is a show normally about failure. Today we're going to talk about how capitalism has failed. Right. But before that, our research threw up the fact that while you were a global strategist at Morgan Stanley, you used to visit a different country every month. Right. Yes, that's right. I was at Morgan Stanley for 25 years. Yes. I, apart from being the chief global strategist uh, on the investment management side, I also run ran their global emerging markets uh, portfolios. And uh, as part of my learning for much of the 25 years that I was there, I would try and go to one emerging market a month. Uh, and that formed my first book, Breakout Nations, yes. which was like an economic travelogue of the world and captured all my observations from all these travels. So it was a great learning experience, you know, to go to China, Brazil, South Africa, or some countries even like Peru and Chile so it was a great journey of the world, and I really learned a lot doing that and tried to create a system out of that, that, okay, after all these travels, you put all the knowledge together, right. and then how are you able to predict which countries will do well and which will fail? So what is the most fascinating thing you've learned on your travels? Where you're like, wow, I did not know this is how things are. To every country I go, uh, yeah. like you always learn something new, and you have really so many fascinating um, experiences uh, where it's meeting different leaders, and seeing how they change over time. Like one of the more fascinating stories that I speak about is uh, about my interaction with Putin. Uh, okay. So for example, I first met Putin at, you know, when he came to New York in about 2003 or so, and he, he would sp uh, speak to foreign investors there at, mm -hmm. at conferences. And that was a Putin who kept saying that he wants to change Russia, he wants to make it more pro-Europe. Um, and typically, uh, after a country has gone through a massive period of uh, turmoil, yeah. there is a consensus among people that we need stability, we need someone to come and fix things, and that's what Putin really did for Russia. He, he, he was a classical reformer uh, in the early few years that he came to power. And then I fast forward to the interaction I had with him in 2010, uh, and how he had, by then, power had gone to his head, mm. uh, the price of oil had gone to yes. over $100 a barrel. And so I had a pretty scary encounter with him back in 2010. And after that, I've, I've never been back to Russia. Scary how? Uh, so if I can sort of indulge the viewers yes. in this little anecdote, which is that uh, in 2010, I was invited to Moscow uh, to uh, speak there at a conference. <clears throat> so I um, took the invitation and then I was told that at that conference, Later, Putin is also going to be there. And then his office called me and said that since he's there, it would be great if you can make a presentation about what does a large foreign investor like you frankly feel about Russia. Mm. So I took that uh, a bit too seriously. I'm a writer at heart and a journalist at heart at some uh, level. And I said, okay, I'm going to make a frank presentation. So then I land up at the Moscow Convention Center and I get on stage. Putin is sitting there on stage as well. Um, and I begin my presentation, and the gist of my presentation is the fact that addressing him in a way that when you came to power in uh, the year 2000 or so, you were a reformer, you brought stability back to Russia, you did these great reforms, and that 
powered Russia ahead for a few years. But today, these are the, all the problems in Russia, that there's arrogance and complacency setting in, there's too much corruption, no mid and small size businesses, just living off one industry of oil at $100 a barrel and stuff like that. So I went on about that. And I could make out there was a lot of unease in the audience. And what I did not bargain for was that this is being telecast live uh, across in Russia. And so, so you were breaking all the unsaid rules. I Probably, because I finished my presentation and I knew something had gone wrong. I wasn't quite sure what it was. I took some comfort for the fact that Putin, after that, I shook hands with him and then he spoke about uh, his vision of Russia where he referenced my presentation a couple of times. So I thought, okay, this has gone okay. But then the organizers didn't talk to me. I went back to my hotel. Next morning, I was woken up uh, by the... Uh, a very senior person from Morgan Stanley uh, in New York. And that person was telling me that uh, in terms of uh, what have you done? And I was like, what have I done? He said, haven't you read the press this morning? I said, I don't read Russian press. What's happened? It's all Kremlin controlled. Yeah. And they would really gone after me in the, in the media to say that you've come here, you've spoiled the party and who needs your money? And we have hundred dollars of barrel oil and we have so many things going. And in terms of, you know, that, if people like you are here, we don't need your money, you can take your money and leave and stuff. And I was advised by my office that you better uh, leave the country. So I left Russia then and I've no, never gone back. back. Yeah, I mean, I haven't been back. So it was a bit of a hairy experience back then, but it taught me again that how leaders change over time. Mm. Uh, you know, so that's one of the rules that I kept in mind that when a new leader comes to power, they behave very differently. And the longer a leader stays to, uh, in power, uh, more likely like the diminishing returns to power. So that's what these visits did, that it triggered some thought and then I would go back to the office and get my researchers to actually quantify this, right? Because these could be anecdotal stuff. This is one leader, but does it really work? Uh, but yeah, it does work, which is that if you look at stock market returns of different countries, you find even the US, the first term tends to be much better than the second the term. Second term yeah. uh, there's a second term curse, which so they refer to. New leaders, only a new leader for that much time. Yeah, you know, they become old leaders. Yeah. New energy, new yeah. leadership. They come there, they do stuff. Now, there are no 100% rules. There will always be exceptions. But the weight of probability is against that. Rajiv, I do want to ask you a couple of questions about yourself. Uh, this is a show about failure. Um, and all of the research we did about your life seems like a solid track record. Have you ever had moments of failure? Of course. Uh, you know, one of my favorite hack lines is that we tend to compare our insights with other, other people's outsides. Okay. So on the outside, it appears as if, you know, this has been uh, like all a smooth ride, but internally you're always questioning yourself. And one of the downsides of being an investor is the fact that you're always subject to the whims and fancies of the market. Now, there are phases I've gone through mm. when I've not understood the market. But why is the market doing what it is? And that period can go on for months, if not years. And then you feel like, uh, you know, someone who who's, doesn't understand the world anymore. So I go through these periods of self-doubt, or like all the time. But that's when you have to build your mental toughness. How do you build your mental toughness? By, you know, sort of just trying to sort of, um, so this brings me to another hack line, which I like which is live life in parallel and not in series. Okay. So what that really means is that don't have a unifocused life where you only do one thing. Like I'm, for the next five years, I'm going to focus just on investing. Or the next mm -hmm. 10 years, I'm not going to take a holiday. I just need to focus all on doing something like this. Because what that does then is that that's what sort of then makes you focus on just the problems. Whereas if you have a multi-task life where I believe that I, should, I have to take a vacation every four or five months, I believe that every day of mine needs to be complete. I keep like 6 to 7.30 every evening uh, uh, for my sprinting. I'm a sprinter mm. as well for my training and everything. That's almost non-negotiable wherever I'm in the world. Okay. You know, and that I find is a form of meditation. Uh, similarly, I uh, make it a point to connect with my core friends all the time uh, in terms of that. So that's about living. A, you know, I love... Uh, trying out new food places, new hotels, traveling and, and doing that. That's about living life in parallel. Uh, so I think that that's what helps me do that. But otherwise, we all go through phases where you feel like self-doubt. So it's so interesting that you asked me this because I did another interview yeah. and they asked me a question which was exactly the opposite. <laughs> so their question they asked me was that, 
you've written this book, which is what went wrong with capitalism, and yet the number of billionaires in the world mm. has exploded uh, in your time, which is my time, from about 100 or so in 1980 to 3,000 today. Don't you regret not being a billionaire? <laughs> right? So there's one way of looking at that. I can think of myself with creative dissatisfaction. I said, why are you saying that? They said, you've lived in New York, yeah. you know, like in terms of you appear to have the smarts. Why aren't you not a billionaire by now? Yeah. So I can look at life that way and say, hey, am I a failure? Because I did not achieve that level of success. So it's all relative as well in terms of what you do. In, when you live in a place like New York, yeah. you know, like no matter how uh, successful you may think you are or you, or you actually are, the game people are playing there is just of a different level. Yeah. You may think you've got a great place on Central Park, but then you meet all these people who have like five such places or five times bigger than you are. So it's all a very relative thing in the mind, Faye. What is your measure of success for yourself? You know, my, uh, I've been thinking about that a lot. I think my measure of success is when I will be a free agent. Okay. And the free agent means that I will not be moved by what's happening in markets or by what other people are saying about me. That's being, for me, that's the ultimate level of uh, being a free agent, the freedom of being, uh, of, uh, being judged. Uh, because today you still are you know, concerned, is my book going to sell well or not? Uh, is, you know, like how, how are my investments doing? Mm. Uh, in terms of you know, what are the critics writing about uh, my book and stuff? Yeah. Those are all things which suggest that I'm still aspiring for success. Uh, the true success will be I'm a free agent. And I know people like that, uh, where I think that, uh, you know, one of the people that I, uh, I worked for, uh, one of the great attributes he had, and it appeared almost too irreverential, is that uh, he, uh, as someone said uh, in his obituary, that he's one person who could say no to a dinner invite without saying why. Uh, you know, so there's something about very liberating about that where you've just become such a free agent where you're not really concerned by what the outcome is. And I think that that's what I define as the ultimate uh, level of success that I'd like to get to someday. I remember reading also that you decided at 18 that this is vaguely what you want to do. You started writing a column and I still, I'm curious to know how an 18 year old gets a column in a financial daily. But from then till today, were there moments where you said, did I make the right decision or is it time to move on? Uh, you know, is there something else that I should be doing? Because a lot of young people watching have that, you know, the challenge of choosing who you want to be when you grow up. Yeah, so I think that's a great point because uh, uh, there's no doubt that, so when I was in high school uh, or you know, like around the 11th grade, that's when I sort of fell in love with economics. And that was always my biggest comparative advantage because there were many other people in school and college uh, in school who were brighter than I am, who scored much higher than me uh, in their exams uh, and such. The one key advantage I had was that for some reason, I fell in love with economics and I wanted to know how to make money with it. So I loved this culture of uh, being on Wall Street. I would love reading all these financial papers back then, which had turned pink, uh, like the Financial Times or other papers and you know, what they were saying. I would listen to the BBC, the World Business Report, and try and figure out what's happening in the other parts of the world. So at an early age, I was able to figure that out, and that became a comparative advantage that I just focused all my energy on one thing, which was economics and economics related, and I almost did not care about how I did in other subjects and stuff. And so um, I took a summer internship for the period between you go to school and college uh, at the age of 17. Mm -hmm. I started writing, and, uh, but, um, and then the Economic Times asked, at the age of 18, as you said, uh, asked me to start writing a global economics column for them. It was called Forex Watch. And the only way I was able to do that was because I had studied a lot on my own mm. in terms of what was happening in the rest of the world. And the Economic Times, it was a secret I kept from them that I was uh, still in, uh, in college. Yeah. Uh, back, back then, I'd entered college. Uh, and I, was, I kept that as a secret because I was so fearful. You talk about, uh, you know, like in terms of everything appears like a straight line. I thought that any day they're going to find out that I'm just a college kid and they've given me this prominent column to write in bold typeface and stuff. So any day they're going to find out mm. and I'm going to be sort of, you know, kicked out. And for me, that was, would have been devastating at that age. And then I've gone through enough periods of self-doubt. Uh, 
I joined Morgan Stanley in, in 96. And in 1998, there was a big financial crisis in East Asia, as you may yeah. recall, and uh, in Russia and East Asia. And some of the key people who hired me got fired. Uh, and that was devastating for me because I had just joined. I was uh, 24 years old mm. back then, and I lost my mentors. And I didn't have a properly defined job. And I remember being told by uh, some of the new people who were taking over that you will not last here for too long. Uh, you know, in terms of, you know, we don't really have a proper job for you. And I lived through that period of great uncertainty because you joined Morgan Stanley. It was a big deal those days to be working for a financial firm of that kind of, uh, you know, blue blood uh, background. And if I had lost that job, uh, I don't know where I would have landed up. So you never know how these things land up. But I've gone through enough periods of self-doubt. In 2008, I, you know, we saw the global financial crisis uh, and the Morgan Stanley stock that we had uh, literally got wiped out to zero. Uh, so you sort of, uh, you know, like your life's, uh, a, a significant part of the savings uh, getting annihilated yeah. uh, in that period. So we've gone through enough periods of self-doubt. I turned bearish on China uh, in 2016 or so, like I started writing bearish, and for a few years, China kept on doing relatively well after that. Um, and so many clients would ask that, you know, have you missed something? Uh, have you lost it? Uh, like the touch of being able to predict which markets do well, which don't do well. So we have all gone through these pa uh, phases of self-doubt, uh, but it's about how do you build mental toughness uh, through, that, through that phase, through that period, and never lose sight of, uh, you know, what is your end? Uh, that all this for me is a means towards the end. The end is how do I become a free agent? Or, and the end of, you know, which I keep reminding myself is that if you go on vacation, that's the end. Uh, because people go on vacation, they're still thinking of office and what's going on. No, no, that's all the means. The end is the vacation. So when you're there, you gotta be present in the moment. So these are all lessons that you have to constantly remind yourself of and build mental mental toughness over time. What is your advice for uh, investors? Any kind of investor, anybody who's evaluating, deciding, figuring out how to navigate the system. I find it a bit presumptuous but to, like, to give advice because there's so many people who made so much money yeah. over the last few years and uh, made so well. But if there's one general observation, you know, as a building, as a team that I would give, I think it goes back to my point, which is that I think the most underestimated skill in investing is temperament. The most overestimated skill of investing is analysis. Mm. So you have too many people who I know that do analysis paralysis, which is that analyzing everything back, forth, and other, but very little ability to make a decision and stick with it. And some of the best investors I know have great temperament. Uh, you know, that they're able to just ride the waves, not be moved by what's happening on a daily market basis, uh, truly think long term. Mm. And they're the ultimate survivors for me. So that's what I'd say that uh, focus as much on having the temperament for investing rather than just the analytical skills. <laughs> okay, so let's get to the book. Uh, it talks about what's wrong or what went wrong with capitalism measured in America over the last hundred years. But before we get into that, would you explain to us what capitalism is outside of the nine standard economics textbooks? No, well, I think at a very basic level, what capitalism for me is the idea of freedom, which is that capitalism is about giving people as much economic freedom as possible mm. so that their individual initiative can then flower, which is to make them feel responsible for their decisions, uh, to give them the authority to decide what is best for them. Yeah. In contrast to socialism, which for me is uh, the government decides for you that this is right or that's wrong and how money should be allocated uh, or what you should import or mm in terms of that and socialism is also like a great idea about having no income inequality and yeah. uh, leveling the field that way. Whereas capitalism, I think there's an acceptance that there will be inequality, but there'll be an equality of opportunity. Hmm. So th there'll be an equality of opportunity, but there may be an inequality of outcome just because it's supposed to re reward meritocracy. Whereas in socialism, it's about the fact that the government is supposed to make sure that nothing Regardless of merit almost, nothing gets too unequal because that's not how it's supposed to be. It's supposed to, like everything is supposed to be collectively shared and the government is the one which decides what you get and what you don't get. 
So, okay, so if I were to break this down, the capital market or the free market as we've taught basically means that you and I sitting next to each other can simultaneously start businesses because we're talented and we're hardworking people. And the environment will allow us to become as successful as we should be given our talent and our hard work, correct? Yes. But is there any part of the world that functions that way? No, so unfortunately, I think that you know, these are all ideals, right? But what in the book I have done, uh, so firstly, uh, I've been a big fan of countries like America. I moved to America uh, more than two decades ago, thinking that that is the land of the free. That's where you have the maximum economic opportunity, and particularly for the profession that I did, which is being a global investor, that you, 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 that you have to be based there. And I admired so much about America growing up. Um, so America, in terms of for me, was the ideal. But in as I moved to America, and particularly the last few years, what struck me there was that despite whatever America is today as a very successful economy, most Americans today are very down on their economy and their country. In fact, about two thirds of Americans today feel that their country or economy is moving in the wrong direction. Uh, and w the most galling statistic, which possibly was the biggest inspiration for this book, is that most young Americans today, especially Democrats say they would rather have socialism than have capitalism. Mm. So this is in America, the beacon of capitalism, where most young people there are telling you they'd rather have socialism than capitalism. So what's really gone wrong with capitalism? Why are pe so many people disaffected with it? And the book's journey begins in India, because yeah. it begins with the fact that I'm a 1970s person in terms of when I was born. And we grew up in even the 1980s facing a largely socialist economy. We're getting a gas connection or a phone connection, took many years and what you could import was uh, so restricted. The amount of foreign exchange that you could spend when you went on a visit abroad was uh, abysmal. So we grew up with that sort of, you know, uh, and we also s saw so much poverty that we had during that era in terms of what it was. And we saw the changes that came upon in India as we moved to a more market-oriented economy beginning yes. with 1991. So I'm, a, at, the, at heart, a big fan of capitalism practiced in its true form. Yeah. But in America, what was dispiriting, and in fact, for much of the Western world, because Europe, I think, is even worse shape, is that they began from this idea of freedom and giving people, but in the last few decades, the government's role in their society has increased uh, many-fold, and not yeah. just about government spending as a share of GDP, which in the US has gone you know, like 100 years ago, the government was 3% of their economy. Mm -hmm. And it basically delivered mail and did defense. Today, it's nearly 40%. Yeah. But it's the culture of bailouts, that why should yeah. governments be bailing out private sector companies? Uh, that didn't happen in America right up until the 1980s. Okay. So if, if I were to pause you here, what you're saying basically is that uh, what's happened in America is that the government has gotten more and more involved in business. Yes. And while there used to be a time when it was only involved in defense and the US, the famous US mail. Now it's involved in many, many types of businesses. And that interference has meant that this is not a pure capitalism anymore. Yes. And that is why the people are not happy with it. Yes, I'm saying that people are, are not happy with the outcome. Okay. Now they don't know why they're not happy with the outcome because, uh, but I argue in the book that capitalism did not fail, it was ruined. And I show progressively how decade after decade, the government's role has ruined capitalism whether it's bailing out rich companies mm. or it's a number of regulations that they institute. You know, when you uh, institute a new, new regulation, you have to understand who benefits from this. It's really the rich. It's really the, the pro-business um, yes. people because they're the ones who are able to manipulate because the regulations. Yeah, so there's a cycle, right? Yes. Like, now again, let's assume um, for whatever reason, we belong to a group of people, yes. the, you and I sitting here starting our businesses, that has greater access when we start our businesses than other people in the room. As we become more successful, we will use our money and power to influence government, to write laws that suit our business, thereby making ourselves more and more powerful, maybe ending up in a situation where there are only two people in this entire country who are powerful and control everything. Yeah. So, so that, that, again, that to me would be a really scary part about capitalism. Yeah, so shouldn't so regulation come in at some point? No, but my entire point is the fact that you can have uh, antitrust, you know, like of when 
things become too big. Yeah, yes. you know, when things become too big to prevent that uh, that from happening, which is fair. But I believe that when you have so many regulations in place, you have to understand uh, who benefits from this. First, the cost of doing business increases yeah. dramatically. Yeah. Like I know, even in America, that as you said, I, I have my own uh, firm today or fund. Compared to 20 years ago, the cost of setting it up has gone up 10 times. Mm. Literally, my lawyers tell me. And that's because there's so many regulations and compliance that you have to yeah. follow now. Now, as a small fund, it's very hard for people to break even anymore. But the large firms, they have the resources, the uh, lawyers and everyone to try and do that. So when you institute so many regulations, as, as America has done, of 3,000 new regulations a year for the last 20 years, then you are really benefiting big business. So what capitalism has become in America today, and the, my fear is that it's happening in other parts of the world as well, and even in Europe, it's become pro-big business, yeah. and it has become pro-incumbent. Whereas capitalism in its true form should be pro-competition and pro-churn. The whole idea of capitalism is the fact that if anybody makes very high profits or supernormal profits, new competitors come and whittle that away. You know, this whole concept uh, appears so quaint now, the, the concept of creative destruction, yeah. which is that you need new, new companies to come and the old and the entrenched to keep phasing away. That's yes. really how capitalism is supposed to work. It's supposed to be pro-churn. And that dynamic has been lost in much of the Western society today. And that is what I lament in the book. So, so in a way, this book is a capitalist lament of what's happened today, which is distorted capitalism, to well beyond what uh, the founders had in mind. So when, for example, if, uh, if we were to what, what the West calls the welfare state, you mentioned it uh, as welfare state, uh, for our Indian audience, when we are feeling ungenerous, we call it freebies, right? But it's also uh, effectively welfare, where we, we give free ration, we give free schooling in India, we give free hospitals. It's not of the quality that we want it to be, but we're paying for it. Um, and there are many, many other things that we hand out in a way to even out the inequality. Because not everybody can afford the same kind of schools, and so the government has to provide schooling, has to provide midday meals in order to keep people on an even playing field to, f to battle it out as capitalists. Where in any government, whether we're talking about the US and you're talking about India, where is that line between um, this is something that is needed because we have to look after our people and we are a capitalist nation and we have to give a free market? Like yeah. is, is there, are these two things in conflict with each other? Not really. I think there's a natural progression that as you make more money, you have the resources to do it, you can afford to do greater welfare. Yes. The issue is that if you do too much of it too early, prematurely, that's when the problems arise. Or if you do it far greater than what is your ability to earn in terms of through taxes. So look, look at the examples here uh, of this, right? Which is that as far as uh, one thing that we forget is that which has been the most successful economic model or economic nation of the last 100 years in a way? It's been China. Okay. Uh, US before that, but yes. last 30 to 40 years, let's say, it's, it's it was China, China okay. in terms of what China has done. I, yes, it's been America's century virtually, but China last 30 to 40 years, what they achieved in terms of economic growth rates at that size, no one's done in the history of economic development, where they grew at 10% a year for 30 to 40 years on average, right? So that was yeah. incredible. China and India had the virtually the same per capita income level till 1990 yes. or so. And then since then, even, even though India's carried out economic reforms, its pace has been much slower, yeah. and we have spent much more on welfare. Now, in China's case- we spent case, the last 20 years looking over our shoulder, comparing our growth rate with China. China, and we were always overshadowed. Only now are we yeah. sort of you know, growing faster, but China's per capita income is already four times larger than what India's is. Its economic size is also nearly that much larger than ours is. So they've clearly you know, moved ahead a lot over the time period. One of the very key lessons from China, even though it was a communist state, was that it followed a form of ruthless capitalism in the, in the 1990s and 2000s, where it told its people that, listen, we're going to spend whatever money we can on building the infrastructure, great bridges, ports, roads, and you have to figure out where you're going to go and work. And uh, you should try and go and work as much towards the areas which are economically successful. So you got this great migration which took place in China towards the eastern seaboard. 
and the 1990s, they fired nearly 100 million people in its public sector enterprises mm. and told them, go and find your own job. And they've spent nothing on welfare in those days, yeah. nothing. So that was the ruthless capitalism that they followed. And look at the results that they got. Now, as far as there were other countries like Brazil or you know, like in Latin America, which decided that we are going to first give our people lots of welfare, mm. uh, let them spend lots on welfare. Uh, and then uh, later on, we'll see what happens. So it, you created a welfare state prematurely, and then those countries have always had a terrible infrastructure. So in terms of, it depends how, you know, that you have that much money. How do you prioritize where to spend it? In an ideal world, you'd like to do both. Yes. Spend a lot on infrastructure, also spend a lot on the needy, uh, you know, in terms of people who need them. But I'd say the fact is that uh, in the case of China, we sh was like we saw what results we got when you uh, do too much of ruthless capitalism in a way, and we saw like in the case of Brazil, what happens when you spend too much on welfare. Mm. So I think- so it's a balance. It's, it's a balance, balance you have to get correct, and you have to also understand what the polity is. In India's case, we cannot do what China did. Yes. We cannot fire 100 million people uh, you know, in, a, in a public sector enterprises, but then that's why we'll never be able to grow like China of nine, 10, 11%, because the kind of reforms that China did uh, and the kind of foreign investment they drew when China was growing really rapidly, FDI, for example, the share of their economy was 4% of GDP. Mm. Even today, countries like Vietnam, which are seen as the next China, they're attracting that kind of foreign investment. Our foreign investment as a share of the economy is still, uh, what, around 1% or so? Uh, coming back to the book, you talk about bailouts. And I mean, for most of us, at least, Occupy Wall Street is very in recent memory. And at that point, the talk was all about we can't let these big banks and companies fail. They're too big to fail. They'll take the whole thing down with them. Your idea of capitalism is they should be allowed to fail. Is that correct? But Broadly. Will they, will they take the economy down with them? Yeah, but I'm saying, but you, uh, so here's how like it becomes, right? Which is that this has become the modern form of what I call trickle-down economics. The old trickle-down economics of under Reagan all so used to be. I have so many questions about that. Yeah, okay. you know, which is the fact that the old question was that we do stuff for the rich and it'll trickle down yes. to the poor. That was the form. Now the, the modern form of trickle-down economics has become bailouts, which is the fact that we can't let these big companies fail because it'll lead to mass employment, it'll, cause, it'll take everything down. But this is what causes increased fragility because even in America's case, as I argue in the book, one of my favorite chapters in the book is on this, is that right up until the 1980s, the concept of the government bailing out a private sector company was concerned heretical. So it's not as if this has always been the norm. Mm but something shifted. Now, when the government begins to get more involved in doing bailouts, then, and that's been the history ever since it did the first major bailout of a private entity in the US, uh, a bank, Continental Illinois in 1984. After that, every bailout has become bigger and bigger and bigger. Why has that happened? Because there's a sort of asymmetry which seeps in there, which is that on the downside, the government says, we, we are here to protect you. Yes. On the upside, you can keep running away with all the profits. Yes. But that just leads to this mechanism where then every And that's time only available to the really big guys. That's right. It's not available to the little guy around mm -hmm. the corner with a shop. Right? Yes. Yeah. And the other thing which it does is that it makes a system much more fragile because then there's no tolerance. There's no, there's no you know, like your system then like isn't building its own immunity. Mm. It's always reliant then on the fact that the government's there. And so it becomes even more fragile that you need bigger and bigger uh, rescues and bigger and bigger... Uh, injections to uh, get the same response back. So, and if something does fall through the cracks, then the consequences are huge because no one's prepared for it. The system has lost its ability to take that. To, uh, to take that to uh, its natural immunity, it's lost to be able to react to any of this. I do want to talk to you about income inequality because you've mentioned a couple of times that with capitalism, there's an expectation that there will be inequality in India. A recent report told us that income inequality, which is the difference of wealth between the rich and the poor, hasn't been this bad since the British Raj. Right. It's, it's a shocking, shocking statement. statement. I mean, yeah. headlines tend to be. You know, I know, because some of this it's data, like, you know, needs yeah. to be passed properly, because I know there's been a lot of back and forth about what have you counted in this, what have you yeah. not counted, and stuff like that. But yes, income but inequality. But let's be fair, we're seeing weddings, you know, of the size that could feed an entire state for a very long time. There is inequality. 
But is that a portion of capitalism that should just make us proud? Or is, that, is, is there an injustice there that needs to be remedied? During the Ambani wedding, there were a lot of people that said, hey, it's their money. They should be allowed to spend it. You know, it's, it's all above board. Uh, it's money that's come from their business that they run successfully. It should be nobody else's business, how they spend their own money. Plus, they're creating employment with this very large event. So it shouldn't be anybody's business to criticize. Do you agree with that? Well, uh, yeah. I, I mean, I broadly agree with the fact of giving people personal freedom and choice to do what they want rather than for you know, them to like intervene and stuff. But w what I do think in India, yes, the, there is an issue in India we have today of inequality. The fact today that billionaire wealth as a share of our economy today is 26%. It's about the largest of any major economy in the world today. It's even greater than the uh, United States. So there is something which I feel that, yeah, this has gotten a bit too excessive in the general. Balance is off. Yeah, the balance is a bit off. So I look for balance. I'm all for billionaires being created. I'm all for the fact that, but when the balance begins to go off is when I get like a bit concerned. So the share has become too large. The only good thing I'll say about India is that I know we focus a lot on the top two billionaires and stuff like that. But the good thing in India, if you look at it like one level below, is that there's been a profusion of new wealth that has been created. There are 200 billionaires in India today. And the largest cohort of billionaires today in this country are coming from the manufacturing sector. Mm. And that's an impressive statistic. And also the fact that, you know, like I first wrote about this billionaire in, the, uh, in my first book, Breakout Nations, and I whole, you know, created a whole billionaire index in there to explain. And I said there are three ways that you should look at this as a good dipstick in terms of what's happening. One is the share like, of the economy. Yeah. If it gets too large and out of balance, it's not a good thing. So, but neither is it a good thing when countries are too low also. It means that they're doing something to choke wealth creation. So yes. how do you get the balance correct? Second, that it's good to have billionaires which come from sectors where the government's not involved. Mm -hmm. So whether it's technology, manufacturing, it's good that where the government's not involved, you're able to create a lot of wealth uh, there because when the government is involved and, you're, and you have too, much, too many billionaires coming from those sectors, it leads to the perception that, you know, that they're really manipulating yeah. government and being able to win. And the third thing, as I argued as a vector, that uh, in terms of self-created wealth versus inherited wealth. And I think that people respect uh, those, that wealth more which is self-created self rather than wealth which is merely inherited. So I think that those are the three metrics we should look at. And India, at least on two of those, those three currently, is a bit of a red flag. Mm. One is the shares become very large. And secondly, that a lot of the wealth is still inherited. The place where we have improve, which is a bit counterintuitive to the narrative, is that a lot of this now wealth creation is happening in sectors which are with not much government involvement compared to 10 to 15 years ago, where when there was so much wealth being created in real estate, construction, mining, those are sectors where you know that government uh, is, plays a much bigger role and you can manipulate it more easily. You did say that you felt 26% is too much of, uh, you know, a share towards the billionaires. What, what is the ideal in your mind? Can well, I think the good thing to do is to look at what the rest of the world is okay. in terms of what the average is. And the rest of the world is roughly half this. So oh. we are pretty much out of whack as far as that's concerned. Now, part of it, of course, is because we've had such an incredible stock market boom uh, yes. that there's no other country uh, literally in the world that's had a stock market boom like India's had over the last five years or so. So that is inflating it a bit. But I think that India in general in terms of what I would focus on is the fact that, uh, that it's a bit out of balance and also that in India you still need more self-generated billionaires compared to yes. the inherited. So those are the two metrics that we're slightly off. Good news is that because manufacturing and others are throwing up billionaires, the concentration also is reducing a bit rather than the way it optically appears that it's all about yeah. uh, you know, a couple of people. You did say uh, we don't have a very great share of foreign investment. What are the reasons why India doesn't have great foreign investment? It's still, as I said, it's a very tough place to, like, to do business in. And then we've also now got premature protectionism, which is setting in, which is the fact that if you Im impose tariffs on this import and that import, then you know, like in terms of it gets much harder to uh, export uh, because you need the inputs to make those uh, uh, exports. Yeah. So I'd say that some of these policies is what is still coming in the way. I mean, and the fact that on the ground when you go, you want to set up a business, or you want to shut it down, 
it is a very onerous project to do. So no matter what they say about ease of doing business and stuff, on the ground level, still a very tough country to do business in, even more so for foreigners. So, they, so whoever's coming in is more happy to just give the money to some local entrepreneur yeah. and who, who can negotiate the system rather than to get directly involved with this. And the, ex the, uh, the impressive run that we've had in our stock market, does that reflect what's happening on the ground? And if it doesn't, is that a bubble that's going to burst, in your opinion? Yeah, I'd say that, I mean, the stock market's rise has been spectacular, but it has broadly been matched by a lot of earnings growth as well. This is not a stock market that's running on empty, because the real true bubbles at the end in particular, are when uh, prices get out of control, yeah. but there's no earnings growth or fundamentals to support it. So yes, the other trend which has happened in India is the fact that you've had this trend of what we call financialization, which is that you have so many people for the first time entering the equity market, and that trend has now become more and more entrenched. Every month, you have flows which come in uh, from domestic, domestic investors. From SIPs. Yeah, 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 as we call it. And so that's leading to the stock market going higher and higher. But it's also being backed up by the fact that so far, earnings growth has been good. Now, if earnings growth begins to fall and you know, the market keeps going up, that's a sign of a bubble. Uh, but at least we, have, we haven't had that as yet. And also because around the world today, you know, in terms of very few other countries have done well. And India is among the very few countries today which is seen to do, be doing okay. So therefore, that's also of late attracted some foreign capital. But my feeling here is the fact that if I was an Indian, uh, I'd be looking to see if I have an opportunity, how can I diversify this a bit rather than just sort of be in the Indian market because we have become uh, so expensive compared to the rest of the world. Having said that, I still feel the fact that this has been largely been backed by fundamentals and amplified by this trend of financialization and equitization that's taking place. I remember about 20 years ago, uh, SEBI and the mutual fund uh, you know, companies, there was this whole call about the fact that we were too dependent on foreign investors and they could literally take the carpet out from under your feet whenever they felt like it. So we need to build a base of domestic investors and the guys who come in with the SIPs are unlikely to sort of yank out at, on short notice. Does this make us more stable? Yes, it does. Uh, because uh, around uh, that was a, a problem to do because I see the relative comparison, which is that there are other countries where you do not have such a strong base of domestic investors. Yeah. And I see the volatility th those countries go through in terms of up and down, up and down kind of stuff. So yes, I am much more concerned about uh, those countries than countries, and uh, typically co countries which have a better domestic base, they end up uh, doing far better as far as valuations are concerned. The other story that I thought was interesting, and it, it reminded me of something in your book, was in India, we right now have our sort of middle car market that is starting to collapse. There used to be a time when, uh, when a young person got a job and sort of their first sign of success was they would go out and buy a car. Yeah. That's apparently not happening anymore. Uh, recently, there was a story that Maruti has started to slow down its inventory because it's piling up. Is there a gap somewhere in our economy where there's a portion of people who are not getting jobs, not making enough money, and what does that mean for India? No, I think that, uh, that there's a lot that you can see which is not happening right. Even when we traveled uh, around India on my election trips and stuff, I did that even in May. There's a clear urban-rural divide that uh, in the rural areas, you know that demand is not the, has not been that strong. It's been much stronger in urban areas and, and stuff like that. But yet, as I said, that, you know, about India, that old line which goes that everything you say about the country, the opposite is also true. Yeah. So you can find both narratives wherever you go. My broad take on, on India phase is that we are, the trajectory is broadly correct. There are, the pace is not as fast as I'd like it to be uh, in an ideal world. Uh, but I still feel that generally we are moving in the right direction. I just think that the biggest fear I have today is something the, is the fact that we don't get too complacent, that we yeah. don't get caught in this narrative here that we are the world's fifth largest economy, we are destined to become third by the end of this decade, and so there's nothing we need to do, just sit back and ride the wave. I think that's where the problems may really come about. There's another question I've been meaning to, to ask you, and uh, you know, when we talk about startups, we talk about the gig economy. There is a lot of criticism that has now come in as to how the, the gig workers, for want of better terms, are being treated. They're called partners, but that also means that they don't have any of the rights that employees have. There are states like Karnataka that are now considering 
bringing in regulation that will regulate these businesses. Do you see that as regulatory overreach? Or do you see that as something that's necessary that needs to be done? Well, in India's case, I mostly see this as overreach because whenever the government gets involved in something, it, our state's capacity to do it properly is rather limited. And the best growth has happened in those sectors which are not regulated historically. Even the technology sector, remember back in the 1990s, yes. the same thing. You know, like it took off when we didn't even have a, a ministry for technology. Yes. So I'd say that the best thing still happened without regulation is my feeling in India because our capacity to do this at a state level is pretty limited. But, uh, I mean, the tech sector also benefited from sunrise sector tax laws that allowed them to flourish yeah. by withdrawing, by giving them special benefits. That's also technically positive regulation. Right? Yes, yes. But I'm, as I said, that my thing is that, like the government in India has to prioritize though, how much it can do. The capacity for it to do uh, everything is rather limited. So let's prioritize what we need to do. Because it, like even in the book, as I argue that in the West, they want the government to do everything. They want the government to do climate change. They want the government to build new green technologies. They want the government now to do industrial policy. They want the government to do welfare. They want the government to spend on defense because of the threats from Russia, China. You know, what the government can do is endless. They want the government to regulate in all areas possible. They want the government to do antitrust. Where are we going to put a stop to this? Okay, how do you prioritize? These are the four to five things that the government should do. And how do you use technology to get better outcomes? And at least in India's case, digitization has improved outcomes, no matter you know, what we say about that, compared to what it used to be. And similarly, as I said that, we cannot have the government in this country do everything and rely on the government to be the savior. That well, I feel climate is something change yeah. is such, such a great example of, of this entire balance that we're talking about. Because um, big oil, if allowed, would drill everything and burn everything, right? Uh, and there has to be a balance that sort of says, hey, you know what? We can't afford to do this. Does that come from government? Will it come from entrepreneurship? Will it come through capitalism? Which part of that balance would that lie at? Yeah, but even here, in terms of what's happened today, and this is something which I've written about, is that we have ended up getting something called greenflation, which is that, uh, that in, uh, to build a green economy, we need some critical inputs, whether it's copper, aluminium, lithium. You know, we need some of these commodities. We also need oil in general yes. for the overall uh, buildup of, uh, of these kind of factories and other things. Now, if you are to cut their supply prematurely, then you will undermine your ability to build these new technologies as well. So how do you end up sort of doing that, which is that how do you have a smooth ramp down, which is that we, ha we have to move towards a more green economy. I think we all, we all agree with that. But then if you are going to cut the supply prematurely hmm. of some of these by over-regulating and the supply has been short, you'll end up in big trouble. Like, um, once again, goes back to the issue, you know, and it's even more true in America today, that in America today, as I argue, that it has become so prohibitive for people, especially like a young person, to buy a home in America today. One of the big reasons for that is that there's no supply. S uh, supply of new homes is at record lows. Why is that supply gone? Because of, uh, again, regulation, uh, that you can't build here, you can't build there. Uh, so if you completely choke supply out for whatever reasons you're doing that you can't build in my backyard. Mm. That's when, you know, in terms of you end up having, creating problems. So for me, the leading symbol of what's gone wrong with capitalism, particularly in the West, are the very high property prices. That on one hand, you have regulation mm. that is totally cut supply. On the other hand, the demand has been inflated because you have thrown so much uh, easy money in the system that you have all these rich people accumulating homes or rich private equity people accumulating homes. That's the real problem, I think, with capitalism. You have said, of course, now the way out is through it. Yes. Through it means what for a country like America? Does that mean collapse? Does that, uh, how do you go through a problem like this? You, uh, unfortunately, unless and until you get a crisis where the government literally runs out of its ability to spend, I think that it's very difficult for people to reform or mm -hmm. change their ways. The best I can do with people like me at a very small level is to write a book like this to show what true capitalism is about. It's a revisionist history of capitalism. But, uh, but m as I argue in the book, and you've picked up on that line for the last chapter, 
which is that unless you have a crisis, and we saw it in India too, how did we, we truly change our ways? Yeah. When we had in a crisis 91. in 91. Yeah. Similarly, in the last 10, 20 years, look at the countries which have changed course. They've all been countries which have gone through an outright crisis. Of late, Argentina is doing that. 10 years ago, it was Greece, which was like an, a big financial crisis. Today, it's become the big comeback story of uh, Europe. Similarly, if you look at what's happened in, uh, before that in countries like Sweden and et cetera, you need a crisis, unfortunately, to change course. And until that happens, you keep rolling down the same path. Rishi, thank you so much for speaking with me. It's been fantastic. Enjoyed that so much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.